how do you get moral and political progress if you don't get truth? If you have a situation where individuals can't agree on first principles. Hello and welcome to the Enlightenment and its alternatives. The Enlightenment advocated reason, science, democracy and universal human rights as a grounding for human morality and social organisation. In the quarter millennium since, to what extent have these ideals been realised? Has the Enlightenment in fact been successful in bringing about moral progress? Or are there viable alternatives to the Enlightenment vision? Joining us to discuss this fascinating topic tonight are two speakers who barely need introduction. Nevertheless, I will give you one all the same. First of all, we have Stephen Pinker. Stephen is the John Stone Family Professor of Psychology at Harvard University and one of the most prominent public intellectuals of our time. Stephen is the author of Rationality, What It Is, Why It Seems Scarce, Why It Matters, and also Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism and Progress. Also joining us is John Mearsheimer. John is the R. Wendell Harrison Distinguished Service Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago and is considered to be one of the most influential international relations theorists of his generation. He is the author of How States Think, The Rationality of Foreign Policy and The Great Delusion, Liberal Dreams and International Realities. Each speaker is going to have around about five or so minutes to lay out their pitch for us. And the provocation that I'll be asking both of them to respond to is, we associate values such as universal liberty and justice with the enlightenment. Do they harm or hinder the world or do they help the world? Now, Stephen, I'm going to turn to you first. Enlightenment values, what do you think? Thank you. So what are enlightenment values or enlightenment ideals? In a nutshell, I would say it's the idea that we should use reason to improve human flourishing. Uh, what do I mean by reason? Well, <clears throat> open deliberation, science, mm. history, evaluation of ideas. And the fruits of reason have been implemented in certain uh, institutions, in particular, liberal democracy, regulated markets, and international institutions. That would be the Enlightenment ideal in a nutshell. What do I mean by flourishing? Well, I mean things that each of us wants for ourselves and by extension can't deny to others. Life, health, sustenance, prosperity, peace, freedom, safety, knowledge, leisure, happiness. Now, the ideals of the Enlightenment are not to be confused with the idea that we should venerate some great men of the 18th century. They were just guys. It's the ideas that count. Uh, and certainly not that we should exalt the West, because the West has always been ambivalent in its commitment to uh, Enlightenment ideals. There are plenty of counter-Enlightenment the themes that have had great influence in the West. Uh, what are the alternatives? Well, of course, there's religion, that we should obey God's commandments and holy scriptures. There's romantic nationalism and authoritarianism, that nations embodied in <clears throat> strong leaders should strive for historic greatness. There's uh, various forms of zero-sum struggle that subjugated victim groups must overcome aggressive, aggressive groups, and there are reactionary ideologies that we should reject modernity and return to a golden age. Uh, has the Enlightenment worked? Well, we've had a, a quarter of a millennium to find out, and we can compare this what has happened in the last 250 years for the various dimensions of human flourishing. So let's go to the data. Uh, life expectancy worldwide uh, for millennia hovered around 30 years of age. Today, it is more than 70 years of, um, worldwide and uh, more than 80 in developed countries. Child mortality, historically anywhere from a third to a fifth of children died before the age of five. Now it is uh, three-tenths of one percent, about four percent worldwide. Uh, famine was uh, one of the horsemen of the apocalypse and could strike anywhere when there was a crop failure. Today, uh, famines have been decimated and occur only in war zones and in uh, some autocracies. Extreme poverty, uh, 200 years ago, about 90% of the world lived in what we would today call extreme poverty. Today, it's less than 9%. Uh, <clears throat> great power war, the 800-pound uh, gorillas of the day uh, several hundred years ago were pretty much always at war. Today, they are never at war. The last uh, great power war pitted the U.S. against China and Korea uh, 70 years ago. Uh, democracy, there used to be a handful of democracies. Now a slight majority of countries are democratic, even with the democratic recession of the last decade or so. 
Uh, all the great states and empires used to uh, mete out justice by gruesome forms of torture, like crucifixion, breaking on the wheel, disembowelment. But during the Enlightenment, there was a wave of abolitions of judicial torture, including the United States prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, slavery used to be ubiquitous. All the great uh, states and empires practiced it. Starting in the Enlightenment, there was a trickle of abolitions that grew into a flood. Today, slavery is not legal anywhere on earth. Um, homicide in Europe used to be about 35 per 100,000 per year. In uh, Europe now, it's about one per 100,000 per year. Other parts of the world are more dangerous, but they've also seen declines. Used to be that about 10% uh, of the world was literate a couple of hundred years ago. Now it's closer to 90%, especially if you look at people under the age of, tw of uh, 25. And it used to be that about uh, less than a fifth of the world had a bit of, uh, basic education. Today, it's uh, almost four fifths. Uh, also today, uh, countries that are guided by Enlightenment ideals, and I would roughly uh, identify those with liberal democracies, are, according to um, uh, our best data, the healthiest countries, the safest in terms of, of, of um, safety from, from uh, violent crime and war, the cleanest in terms of measures of environmental quality, the happiest, and they are the most popular destination of people who vote uh, with their feet. People want to go to liberal democracies if they uh, possibly have the opportunity. Well, I'll, I'll leave the case of the Enlightenment at that for now and uh, look forward to hear what John, what, uh, John has to say. I want to make it clear that I'm not arguing that there has been no progress since 1680, which is when the Enlightenment started. Uh, and I'm not arguing that the Enlightenment didn't contribute to some of that progress, some of which Steve described in his presentation. My argument has to do with the question of whether or not uh, the Enlightenment has led to moral and political progress. And when we talk about moral and political progress, we're talking about first principles. We're talking about questions regarding the good life. And the question is, has the Enlightenment created a situation where there is large scale consensus, almost overwhelming consensus on questions about first principles, on questions about the good life. That would be evidence, in my opinion, of moral progress. And I think that's uh, an argument that Steve makes uh, in his work, that we have achieved uh, both moral and political progress as a result of the Enlightenment. And I, of course, disagree with that. And I want to make three points. First of all, the core argument is that unfettered reason leads individuals to come to agreement about questions regarding the good life. In other words, unfettered reason, or what Steve calls the escalator of reason, leads us toward truth. It leads us towards agreement on first principles, and therefore we make moral and political progress. My argument is that unfettered reason involving lots of individuals does not lead to agreement. In fact, it leads to significant disagreement. People cannot agree about first principles. They cannot agree about questions regarding the political goods. Uh, they cannot agree about questions regarding justice. And therefore, you're not making moral and political progress. And in fact, this is why politics is so important. If you look at Steve's work, politics is not very important because he believes that in the end, you're getting large scale agreement on these central questions. My argument is you don't get central agreement, you get disagreement. And sometimes that disagreement is so fervent that people end up killing each other. And this is why politics is so important in my story. My second point is that people who focus on the Enlightenment focus on the individualism. Uh, radical individualism is associated with the Enlightenment. My view is that human beings are social animals to begin with, who carve out room for their individualism. But because they're social animals to begin with, human beings belong to tribes. 
Today, we call them nations. Human beings are very tribal. And when you're in a tribe or you're in a nation, your identity is inextricably bound up with that nation. You have interests, you have ways of looking at the world. You have views about what is just and what is not just that are bound up with being a member of that nation. So in the end, what that means is that since that individuals are parts of nations and nations disagree on first principles, makes it even harder to reach agreement on what are uh, moral and political uh, answers to the big questions in life. Then finally, there's the matter of international relations. Uh, I actually believe that people who focus on the Enlightenment argue, uh, a la Immanuel Kant, that by using reason, we can come up with what Kant called perpetual peace. Uh, I don't believe that at all. I believe that because the international system is anarchic, which is to say that there's no higher authority in that system, uh, that if a state uses reason to think about how to survive in that system, and of course survival has to be its principal goal, that state and other states are going to engage in security competition, and that security competition is sometimes going to lead to war. So in an anarchic system like the international system, basically you have a situation where reason leads not to peace, but it leads to competition and sometimes deadly conflict. So it's for those three reasons that I disagree with the argument that the enlightenment leads to consensus, to some sort of truth about political and moral factors. Thank you. So Steve, if, if I could return to you and just picking up on John's on John's arguments here, is there is is politics slightly missing from um from the account you've given us so far? I mean, it looked incredibly uh rosy and very very optimistic even. But is there sort of some political context that have been missing? For example, are liberal democracies attractive because actually historically speaking, they were colonial powers, and the countries that are not so attractive were put into very difficult economic situations by successful and quite aggressive states, which are now liberal democracies. Is there any scope for agreed frameworks for reasoning and shared decision making that could lead to the kind of accumulated collective progress that enlightenment seems to feel is necessary? Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> it's called uh, democracy. Uh, the enlightenment thinkers were obsessed with how you can have a political um, uh, organization that is is not vested in, say, a absolute monarch with uh, divinely granted powers. Uh, and <clears throat> the... Um, Ideals such as uh, free speech and um, uh, democracy were absolutely predicated on the fact that people do disagree. There is absolutely no uh, presumption that everyone has the the same values or the same beliefs. That's why you need democracy. That is, given that people aren't going to agree, how are we going to uh, govern ourselves? Um, on the other hand, it's important not to uh, exaggerate how much disagreement there is compared to, say, uh, 250 or 500 years ago, compared to, say, the era of the wars of religion. Uh, the world's nations did sign the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and it has informed um, uh, dozens, uh, scores of, of constitutions. So um, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is pretty detailed, and you've got the uh, every country signing on to it, often, you know, sometimes in the breach, sometimes hypocritically. But the uh, a lot of the ideals actually command you know, pretty wide uh, assent, but not a universal assent. There are still, of course, religious fanatics. There are still authoritarian despots. There are still uh, glory-mad uh, expansionist leaders. But the, uh, uh, the ideals of the Enlightenment are not a guarantee that everyone will come around, but they are arguments about which way we ought to be heading. Um, in terms of individualism, another point that, that uh, John mentioned, uh, you know, among the individual um, uh, needs, uh, benefits is belonging to a group, belonging to a family, having friends, belonging to institutions, belonging to organizations. There's nothing uh, about recognizing the right of individuals that is... Uh, 
uh, that, that contradicts the idea that we like to belong to groups as long as they don't coerce us, as long as we can leave those groups. And that includes nations. I mean, it, it is true that that people belong to nations, but not everyone in a nation agrees with everyone else in the nation. That's why we have arguments and political parties and contested elections and people who come and go and leave and disagree with their leaders unless they're threatened with, uh, with jail for doing so. It is exactly uh, a precept of the Enlightenment in its commitment to democracy that people within a nation actually disagree with each other and that the fact that the nation might have a, uh, a religion, an ideology, doesn't mean that it is right for every last individual to be coerced into uh, conforming to it. And we know historically and from current events, people don't. There's, there's lots of dissent in every country as long as it's allowed. Um, in terms of the uh, whether <clears throat> the uh, competition for security means that we will... Um, perpetually be at war. I mean, that predicts that war, the rate of war should be at pretty much a constant level throughout history. And, and it's not, it's gone, you know, it's gone way down, especially since the end of the Second World War. And the rates go up and down, I think, depending in good part on nations' commitments to um, enlightenment ideals versus uh, uh, thirst for glory and grandeur and preeminence. Uh, that's a variable that we see goes up and down and varies from country to country. Countries that used to be at each other's throats for centuries or millennia have decided that they'd be better off cooperating. So that can happen too. I don't think that the um, nature of the international system pins us to a constant level of war at every period in history. Steve, I think if you read your book carefully um, and you read Better Angels, you're other important book from my point of view uh carefully it's very clear that you talk about truth and allowing truth to prevail that's language uh from your book right well so of, approaching the truth yes uh we don't okay. know what it is but we try to get there okay but i would just say that how do you get moral and political progress if you don't get truth if you have a situation where individuals can't agree on first principles and they battle it out, I mean, look at the United States today, the red versus blue divide, and we could point to all sorts of other examples like this. How do you make progress, right? It just seems to me that progress is inextricably bound up with the concept of truth. Now, when you talk about it, you point to progress as the coming of liberalism. And in fact, you say that there is this escalator of reason out there. And you say explicitly that we're getting smarter. And you say explicitly that getting smarter means you become liberal, right? So it looks like in your story to me that the truth is becoming a liberal, establishing a liberal society. And I think that's a hard argument to make. I like liz liberalism very much. I'm thrilled. I'm ecstatic about the fact that I was born into liberal America, right? So I'm not against liberalism. But as you well know, there are a lot of people on the planet who don't like liberalism at all. There are many opponents of liberalism. And if you look at what's been happening on the planet with regard to liberalism, liberal democracies have been decreasing since 2006. So it doesn't look like such a rosy picture. But my more important point is, do you really want to identify progress with liberalism and argue that anybody who opposes liberalism is uh, therefore uh, in the wrong? Yeah, so I would identify progress really with, with human flourishing. Now, some of those ideals like freedom do overlap with liberalism, and I'd be pre prepared to argue that, uh, that they're, they're better values. But some of them like living longer, uh, kids not dying, mothers not dying in childbirth, uh, people not getting uh, stabbed to death in muggings, people not getting thrown in jail because they disagree with the king. Um, I think those are, uh, I get some of those are liberal values, uh, equality of women. I, you know, there are a lot of people who don't agree with, with the ideal of equality of women, to, to put it mildly. But um, but I would argue that those, uh, so there's some that, that I, I think are universally agreed upon, such as health, longevity, um, uh, sustenance. There's some that are uh, where there are holdouts, but there is still a, a pretty uh, significant trend, such as equality of women. Um, uh, the countries that deny women the vote have been dwindling. So the only one left is uh, is the Vatican. 
um, the direction in terms of laws that uh, discriminate against women is that they are falling off the books. The uh, uh, countries that have laws that criminalize homosexuality are liberalizing that. So actually, I think there is actually a, a, a trend toward liberal values. But um, and, and I think they are most defensible. That is, if you have uh, an open discussion, an open argument, if, if people uh, from different backgrounds have to come together and decide what they agree upon, which they're motivated to do in order to have a, uh, a global community where they're not at each other's throats, then they do tend to settle on certain universal values. And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the, the most obvious example. If someone were to say that the first uh, universal principle is we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, well, you know, a lot of people are going to fall off, the, <laughs> fall, fall by the wayside. But if it's that people should uh, ha have an education, that people shouldn't be uh, jailed because of their opinions, then it's you know, much harder for someone to argue against them. And, uh, and historically, that's why I think liberal values in general have uh, uh, actually have uh, increased. You're right that democracy has uh, stalled in the last uh, 15 years or so. But still, as the graph that I uh, threw up before showed, it has stalled. It may even have gone down a bit, but it's still way higher than it was you know, 20 years ago to say nothing of 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. But there's not a consensus there. That's the point. But I just want to uh, go a step further on this. One of the points that's clear from reading your book is that you believe that if you go to the academy, academia, the world that you and I operate in, there are huge numbers of people who you think are uh, at odds with your way of looking at the world. These are people who are not using reason for good ends. If the academy where you would expect people to privilege reason is filled with individuals who think in ways that you think are contrary to producing progress, how can you argue that we're moving in a positive direction? And it's not only that, the academy that you point to, you also point to a large number of great thinkers, people who uh, uh, enjoy great esteem in the academy, people like Foucault, people like Fanon, people like Nietzsche, as people who are hindering progress, people who are getting in the way. You also argue that anybody who believes in these isms, these ideologies, or, you know, is asking for trouble. It's also, ideologies are also a hindrance to progress uh, on the moral and political front. Given this panoply of forces that are acting in ways that are contrary to your argument, how can you argue we're making progress? Yeah, so, uh, and, uh, you know, I'd be the first to say that there are a lot of pathologies in a number of our institutions, not least the one that employs the, the, the two of us. Uh, and, you know, in that regard, your institution is doing a whole lot better than mine. Uh, University of Chicago comes close to the top in rankings for freedom of expression, and Harvard comes close to the bottom. I'm, I'm working to try to change that. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, the most general answer to your question is, a belief that there has been progress is not a belief that everything gets better everywhere for everyone all the time. Uh, you know, that wouldn't be progress. That would be a miracle. And I, you know, I don't believe in miracles. Uh, progress is uh, is uh, incremental. It is. It has uh, setbacks. It has to because it's not a force of the universe. It's not a. And this, you're you're right that there was a conception of progress as some mystical force that carries us ever upward. That's not what I'm advocating at all. Quite the contrary, most of the forces of uh, the uh, of, of the universe are kind of trying to grind us down, and we push back with deliberation, with reason, with argument, with evidence. And there's no guarantee of success. Uh, sometimes brute force wins. Sometimes people are under the spell of delusions or malignant ideologies. Um, so there's no the idea that the the normative argument of what we ought to do, and the uh, descriptive argument of where we are. Are, uh, are are separate. It could be that there are certain things we ought to do and not enough people are doing them and they should change and we should try to persuade them to change. Uh, but yeah, things could go wrong. And, and in some places, things have gone wrong. I think on average, we're better off now than we were 100 years ago or 200 years ago, to say nothing of uh, 2000 years ago. But, uh, but yeah, stuff happens. Things go wrong. Progress is not always the getting it right and accumulating that rightness. Maybe it's the understanding more about how you might go about getting it right. John, is that is that a convincing argument for you? 
No, but my point, Sophie, is that for an academic like you, an academic like Steve, and an academic like me, we should realize that deliberation and reason in different individuals leads to different conclusions about what is the political or moral good. At all of our universities, what you find are huge numbers of people who are very smart, who have truly impressive uh, critical faculties, who can't agree on much of anything. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a bit of an exaggeration. There's certainly plenty of disagreement. There's no question. But you know, how many? And again, by the way, I don't want. I want to distinguish academia, which is an institution, which you know, as we both agree, has has some pathologies. But that's not the same as the larger, say, republic of letters, the intellectual sphere, which also includes you know, think tanks and publications and newspapers and independent bloggers and so on. Uh, but uh, even within academia, there's not a whole lot of people who would give a defense of, of a return to traditional gender roles, that women should be kept out of the workplace, or that uh, gay pe that homosexuality should be criminalized, uh, or that uh, war is heroic and manly and thrilling and spiritual, and that humanity will uh, become decrepit if we ever uh, have peace. Arguments that people used to have that are pretty much uh, obsolete, that we should have racial segregation. Um, that we should look to the Bible as a source of history as opposed to science. Uh, there's plenty that we agree on, and there is there's certainly a, a pretty big froth of disagreement on top. But uh, but there is intellectual progress in the sense that there are crazy superstitions that were pretty and and monstrous beliefs that people by uh, by and large have abandoned, at least in in arenas where you can uh, make arguments about them. So, John, are you confident that things aren't going to slip backwards again, or do you see new myths forming to replace the old ones? Well, it's not so much myths. I, again, I think that reason can lead individuals to come up with smart views that the world works in one way and lead other individuals to come up with smart views that the world works in other ways. In international relations, the world I operate in, I have a particular theory of realism. I argue that realism best explains how the world works. Steve is a very smart guy, and he uses his critical faculties to think about how the world works, and he comes up with a fundamentally different view of international politics than I do. It's what I would call a liberal view. And that is my basic point, that smart individuals, right, can use their critical faculties to come up with different views. And when you have different views, how do you have progress? The fact that Steve and I disagree about international progress, about international relations, makes me wonder whether it makes sense to talk about us achieving progress in understanding how the world works. If we take, say, the history of science as our guide. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.